On February 24, 1968, the submarine K-129 with 98 sailors and three nuclear missiles on board left Krasheninikov Bay in Kamchatka for its last combat voyage. On March 7, under mysterious and still unclear circumstances, it sank in the Pacific Ocean 2890 kilometers northwest of Hawaii. Six years after the tragedy, the Americans carried out an unprecedented engineering operation, trying to raise the dead submarine from a depth of more than 5 kilometers. Already in the 1960s, submarines capable of carrying nuclear ballistic missiles became an integral part of the navies of the two world powers, the United States and the USSR. The first Soviet submarines, originally designed to be equipped with such weapons, were forced to go on combat duty directly to the shores of the likely enemy, primarily the United States, because of their short range. K-129 was no exception, being a part of the 15th Squadron, based in the village of Rybiki on the Kamchatka Peninsula. In her next trip of this kind, which turned out to be the last, the boat left in the early morning of February 24, 1968. She was again in the Pacific Ocean largely by chance, the ship had returned from a previous patrol only a month and a half before that date, but had been forced to replace a similar submarine that had failed. Once in the open sea, K-129 and 98, according to other sources 89, crew members made a test dive, reported on its success and went on with radio silence. The next time the submarine was to make contact was March 8 after passing the 180th meridian, the international dateline. However, neither on March 8, nor in the following days, the duty officers on duty at the Central Command Center of the Navy did not receive a signal from K-129. Active search for the missing submarine Soviet Navy began only two weeks later, but all the efforts of a huge squadron of ships did not succeed. Too large was the likely area of the disaster, and no means of tracking the ship, which could shed additional light on its fate, the USSR did not have. But the United States did. In the 1950s, the United States began extensive work on the deployment of hydroacoustic system SOSIS. In different parts of the world ocean on the proposed patrol routes of Soviet underwater missile carriers were installed numerous bottom microphone grids, the main task of which was to listen to the sea in an attempt to detect the noise of boat engines. Noticing the unusual bustle of more than 30 Soviet ships in the North Pacific, the Americans assumed that such activity might be related to the loss of one of the subs, and then turned to SOSIS data. The system's acoustic stations, of course, were also present in the area of K-129's disappearance. Having analyzed the accumulated data, American specialists, according to their statement, really recorded a certain sound of a single explosion in a conditional spot of 30 square miles very close to the 180th meridian. 1230 kilometers from Kamchatka and 1100 kilometers north of Midway Atoll. While the Soviet ships were unsuccessfully looking for a needle in a haystack, the U.S. had information about the specific area where the tragedy could have occurred. According to this information, K-129 perished on March 7, the day before the planned crossing of the dateline. In July 1968, four months after the disappearance of K-129, the U.S. Navy launched its first covert operation, called Sand Dollar. From the famous Pearl Harbor base in Hawaii, a unique submarine USS Halibut, designed for special operations, was sent to the SOSIS determined area. She was literally packed with the most advanced oceanographic equipment of the time, including sonars, diving cameras, and an underwater vehicle with video and still cameras. Several weeks of careful underwater research bore fruit. In August 1968, the remains of K-129 were discovered. The boat was lying at a depth of just over 5 kilometers. A large vertical crack was observed in the aft deckhouse area, and the missile silos were also badly damaged. USS Halibut in the course of its expedition made more than 20,000 pictures of the lost ship, then returned to base, and in the offices of the CIA headquarters in Langley Boyle Analytical Work. What happened to the K-129, it was never fully established. The Americans believed that the cause of the disaster was an abnormal operation of the engines of the Air-21 missiles on board. The official Soviet version was the failure of the submarine to a prohibitive depth of immersion due to a malfunction of the valve in the RDP, a device for engine operation underwater, let's say in a pipe like a snorkel, which provided air intake necessary for the operation of the diesel engine of the ship. Many sailors of the Soviet Navy are convinced that the tragedy was caused by the collision of the K-129 with an American submarine pursuing it. A week after the disappearance of the Soviet missile carrier, 
the American submarine USS Swordfish arrived at the Japanese naval base of Yokosuka. Soon a photograph appeared in a local newspaper showing some damage to the ship's deckhouse area. Soviet sailors are sure that they were caused by a collision, most likely unintentional, with K-129. Such incidents were indeed not uncommon during the Cold War. U.S. and Soviet submarines, engrossed in pursuit of each other, sometimes approached each other at critical distances. However, whether the USS Swordfish could have inflicted such catastrophic damage on a Soviet ship with only a bent periscope, at least visually, remains a matter of debate. According to the official version, the USS Swordfish collided with an iceberg a couple thousand nautical miles away from where the K-129 was lost. Meanwhile, the study of images taken by the USS Halibut continued for about a year. In 1970, at a meeting between U.S. Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird, National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger, and unnamed CIA and Navy experts, it was decided to try to raise the wrecked submarine. The prize was sweet, its very design and the weapons, radio communication systems, encryption, target designation, and navigation systems on board were of interest. Here it should be noted. The Soviet Union by this time has not officially recognized the loss of the boat. Accordingly, according to the letter of the law, the Americans had every right to dispose of its remains as they saw fit. The ship found at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean was considered ownerless property, and it was impossible to even call it a fraternal military burial ground. The eternal Soviet complex with refusal to publicize its own failures and setbacks eventually allowed the United States to realize an unparalleled naval engineering project, codenamed Azorian. After the development of the theoretical plan in November 1972, the U.S. began its practical realization. At two shipyards located in different parts of the country, unique vessels were laid down independently of each other, with the help of which it was supposed to carry out the operation to lift K-129. The main vessel was named Hughes Glomar Explorer. To create a plausible legend that would justify its long stay in one point of the Pacific Ocean and to divert Soviet eyes, the CIA turned to the services of eccentric billionaire Howard Hughes, famous not only for his strange behavior in the last years of his life, but also for his sometimes revolutionary engineering endeavors. In addition, his companies were major Pentagon contractors. Hughes agreed to be a screen name for the entire Azorian project. According to the official version, the Hughes Glomar Explorer was designed for deep-sea drilling, and its purpose was to search for promising ferromanganese nodules under the ocean floor. Hughes' credibility and reputation were so great that after the presentation of the project, many competing companies were seriously interested in similar exploration. Hughes Glomar Explorer, in fact, was disguised as a floating drilling platform, the center of which was topped by a giant metal derrick. Under it was the so-called moon pool 60 meters long, actually a huge chamber, where K-129 was to be secretly raised. At the same time, the entire 100-meter submarine for objective reasons would not fit there, that is, the Americans initially counted only on the lifting of its bow and central part, where the most valuable equipment was located from their point of view. What exactly was inside it is still unknown. We can only speak accurately about two nuclear torpedoes and the bodies of six Soviet sailors. Sometime later, the Americans reburied them in accordance with the custom at sea, covered with the flag of the Soviet Navy and to the sound of the Soviet anthem. The videotape of the ceremony was handed over to the Russian authorities after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The first details of the Project Azorian became known to the press back in 1975, but until now it has not been fully declassified. The real reason for the death of the submarine K-129 and 98 Soviet sailors in the Pacific remains a mystery. Behind this tragedy lies an engineering operation in which mankind once again tested the capabilities of its mind. The experiment cost the United States six years of work and nearly four billion dollars. This is the price of just one and not the brightest episode of the Cold War.